research was kind of done and at the encouragement or at the encouragement of both Dr. Daddy and Dr. Sharp. Um, Dr. Daddy took a trip to India not too long ago and brought back some matrimonial ads. And from those ads, I created a database. And um, using that database and some other textual research, I'm kind of looking at, on my research looks at India's color complex and how it affects the matrimonial mate-seeking mate process of women. Marriage in the historical heteronormative sense provides both men and women with a measure of, of social capital. Nevertheless, due to the institution's patriarchal history, it is imperative for women more than men to conform to the normalized idea of beauty, to individually amass the necessary amount of social capital to be considered marriageable. Due to this, due to their um, often evaded social and economic status, globally femininity and beauty are correlated with white skin. S similarly, India's complex relationship with colorism means that within the country, beauty is synonymous with fair complexion skin. Debate persists about the origins of, of colorism in India, with some scholars suggesting that it is a direct result of European imperialism and others arguing that people around the world possess a natural affinity for fair skin. Nevertheless, it is, it is, a generally, it is generally accepted that colorism is a powerful force in India, especially related to, to the seeking process. Dr. Angela P. Harris argues that the valuing of light skin has evolved in many regions, such as East and South Asia and the Philippines, independently or at least in part of the black, of the black European African dynamics of race that have so characterized the Americas and Europe. However, scholars still debate colorism's origins within India and how this particular form of discrimination relates to the caste system. Um, and there are three main groups. So the first group argues that colorism is a symptom of the dramatic change in Indian concept of race ushered in with the British invasion. They believe that India was not immune to the globalized effects of the racialization of humanity. Um, and when I say racialization, I mean the assignment of racial meaning to real perceived or ascribed differences among individuals or groups um, that uses hierarchies of power and privilege among a certain group of individuals. These scholars emphasize that the British largely ignored the caste system and other Indian values and practices and empowered high status and lighter Indians as regional leaders. In that way, lighter toned skin increasingly became associated with the upper class and light skinned individuals became, began to become more upwardly mobile, while darker, in, darker Indians fell to the bottom of the economic ladder. Um, the second group <coughs> argues that the caste system itself promotes the hierarchy of skin color since lighter skin is more likely to be seen in higher caste members um, and dark skin viewed in, um, in the lower caste members. Um, they declare that the northern <coughs> Indians generally are lighter than their southern counterparts and in each group the upper class tends to have lighter skin. Therefore, some scholars believe that this suggests that fair skin has a long relationship with social status. Um, and color consciousness has, has so far has begun it's suspected that color consciousness, color consciousness excuse me, could have begun with an Aryan invasion of North India, but despite some linguistic similar similarities between the Sanskrit and European languages, little archaeological evidence um, proves that any such invasion. The third and probably most popular group argues that the origins of India's color, India's color complex hierarchy, color class hierarchy, is much more multifaceted. Um, First, there's nothing in ancient Vedic texts or religious scriptures that suggests lighter skin is supreme. Also, the term Arya, um, which is used in some texts, um, may have been used in the sense of noble as opposed to the sense of Aryan race. Um, and based upon the fact that San the Sanskrit term of caste or varna also means color, and there are, I'm sorry, nonetheless, some believe that the color class hierarchy emerged as a means of keeping the caste pure and referencing the term caste which is also which translates to varna which is which means color um, and there are well documented prohibitions against mixing the upper and lower caste now um, however I must also mention the varna also means appearance exterior color kind species caste and so on so 
So suggesting, this suggests that when scholars focus on one particular definition of a word, they can sometimes um, reach varying um, ideals and, or ideals. <coughs> this is a general consensus. There's a general consensus that India's social order evolved as a system that prides priesthood as opposed to fair skin, and it's more of a religious system as opposed to a racialized. India's color class hierarchy has made it susceptible to colorism. And, and um, though colorism is often linked to racism, I find it's important to mention that these are, in fact, distinct forms of discrimination. So while racism operates as a, dis as a discrimination against persons based upon their racial identity, which is in turn is traditionally designated, which is in turn traditionally designated through a complex mix of self-identification and other identification through appearance, including color and ancestry, colorism is far more integral because it involves discrimination against persons based upon their physiognomy, regardless of their perceived racial identity. It is a subtype of racial phenotypicality bias in which the skin tone and often hair texture is used, to, used as a metric to discriminate against those outside or within one's own racial Racism, it can operate both again amongst and upon a racial group. People within the same race lack the ability to execute racism amongst themselves. However, individuals of the same race can't execute colorism because physical variations often exist within racial groups. Nevertheless, um, a definite connection exists between, between, exists between the two forms of discrimination. Colorism functions as a specific type of group associated with the stigmatization of persons darker skin and the privileging of those with lighter skin. According to some scholars, colorism would likely not exist without racism because colorism rests on the privilege of whiteness in terms of phenotype, aesthetics, and culture. Consequently, non-white members of many societies are exposed to this ideal and adhere to it in their evaluation of themselves and others. Whether colorism emerged at, with racism from the fruits of imperialism or predated the manifestation of white supremacy, it is undeniable that darker complexion beings possess less social and monetary cap capital on a global scale. This is evidence of race capital, which arguably spawned color capital. In an effort to amass monetary and social capital, some people attempt to augment their color capital. Intensely dangerous skin lightening creams and cosmetic surgeries have created evidence for people of color around the world to alter Skin, their skin shade and physiognomy. The main Indian customers for those products are women between the ages of 16 and 35. Colorism is a significant parcel of life in Southeast Asia. For example, matrimonial advertisements in India are notorious for specifying a desire for a bride to be weedish or fair in complexion. Thus, the skin shade preference may also <coughs> have a gender specificity in some contexts. Furthermore, skin color relationship with beauty, which is also another form of social capital, makes color capital more essential for women than for men. Globally, a strong correlation exists between light skin and wealth, which is considered the class, the color class hierarchy, which is defined as the social, economic, and political societal framework that follows skin color differences. Possibly, color classism groups began centuries ago in agrarian societies because they laborers possess darker complexions than landowners. However, it, however, it is likely imperialism. It's likely imperialism that exposed the world to what it, we're now experiencing, which is the bleaching syndrome. Colorism complicates gender politics and greatly affects persons perceived social capital. It adds a color component to the social capital women might seek, in, seek to possess in order to present themselves um, desirable for marriage. Women that desire to marry, especially a man of great monetary capital, might find it necessary to possess high color capital or market themselves in a manner <coughs> that makes it appear so. Women who lack the color capital necessary to make, necessary to make themselves marriageable often use skin lightening products and other cosmetic procedures to guard the desired color capital. And this is specifically related to India. Some scholars have hypothesized that the entry of Western media into Indian 
cultural landscape, his Indian cultural landscape, coupled with India's economic liberalization in the 1980s, has led to the preeminence of Western standards of beauty in the country. Additionally, contemporary media, media strongly reinforces colorism, and multicultural mass media promotes a homogenized global body that is, that is being telepathed the world over. And media and advertising foster a hegemonic notion of skin tone that clearly privileges light skin tone. Globalization of media, technologies of body modification, and persistent power of race and gender hierarchies around the globe make the, make the pursuit of racial or color capital an important strategy for economic success, success and marriage is often an economic decision. Um, however, I must mention that um, in Hindi there's a specific word for coloring among women. And please excuse the mispronunciation. Baranji, which translates to um, the one who has the color of the white cow, or Gori, which means fair complexion, skin tone. However, it also means beautiful um, and girl or woman. These definitions um, may in fact destroy not merely beauty, but femininity itself for those women who do not have lighter skin. Within and um, this is extremely relevant because within heteronormative environments, a woman's level of femininity directly affects her marriage ability. Social structures in patriarchal societies, such as India, often reinforce and propagate male privilege while other women's experiences. Those who do not or cannot fit into these stringent norms are likely stigmatized, marginalized, and devalued. In accordance with Indian marriage customs, brides' families often offer dowries. The value of a dowry, a function of the bride's marketability, correlates with factors such as her virginity, physical appearance, domestic skills, and education. There is an inverse relationship or correlation between the desirability of the bride and her dowry. Irrespective of this fact, um, many Indian women still believe that not only can a dowry be used to <coughs> from disadvantage in the marriage market, such as dark skin, but it gives them dignity and status. However, in many cases, in many cases, a dowry is incapable of making a very dark woman seem desirable. To explicate, one woman whose husband attempted to burn her and make her another dowry murder casualty stated that he did so at the urging of his family. The victim's mother-in-law told her son, leave this woman and we will get you another one. What her parents have given us is nothing. Moreover, this girl is ugly and she is dark. Due to the business nature of marriages, this exists, there exists an entire market dedicated to matrimonial advertising. In Indian dailies, <coughs> there are a popular way to see prospective partners, prospective partners, not partners. Most of the national and regional dailies in India devote substantial portions of their, their magazines or um, newspapers to ads every day. Oftentimes, those living with marriage treat people as products, making sure to highlight the best features of the product. Skin tone is seen as an important marker of physical attractiveness, especially in women in India. Tourism is deep-rooted in the country and it results in strong preference, especially in mate seeking for light skin color, for women of light skin. When colorism become, becomes part of the cultural fabric, it promotes social stratification and exclusion based on invalidating preferences. Consequently, pigment hypocrisy develops and women endowed with light skin possess significantly more social capital than their darker competitors for mates. Socially, over the past few decades, beauty and fairness ideals have also become increasingly institutionalized in the marriage market, once again disadvantaging women. So my research was after I put everything into the database, I wanted to analyze the the claims of Rama 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 Subraman Nines and Jane's hypothesis of two thousand nine, which declared that women announced their skin complexion more than men made known the desire for light skin complexion women in these um, advertisements, and few if any advertisers describe themselves as dark. So after um, compiling my database, I found that there were 424 advertisements, this is just for one day, 424 advertisements for bride requests, and there were 411 bride advertisements. 
So, and those were the average, the average age was for the men um, who sent the bride request. Um, eight was 30, and the range was between 23 and 55. And of those men that requested brides, approximately, approximately 20% identified their city. And um, these were the names of the largest cities of Delhi, Mumbai, and Gurgaon. Gir and in reference to the women, there were only 411, so not too many fewer. And the range was between 20 and 54, and the average age was 30, approximately the same. And the city was approximately the same as well, the city percentage. And the only different city was Nairobi. And of these top three cities, these were also the top places they emphasized skin color, which may reinforce the hypothesis that this emphasis on colorism may be a part of globalization. So here's a breakdown of my data. So table one is basically, this is basically the table of men who state what they desire or their, their physical desires for a wife. Um, and this this analysis, <coughs> this analysis states the importance of marketing oneself as a normalized embodiment of beauty and emphasizing kind of it emphasizes the patriarchal nature of marriage. Because as you can see, I'll stick for this part. As you can see, so twenty of compared to the men and the women. So actually double the the, the women mentioned their skin complexion. Skin complexion as some to those men who stated what they desired. So there was no preference for it. Like they indicated what they were when it was a woman 60% of the time. But in regards to the men, um, only 80%, about 80% of the time, they didn't even say what they were fair or very fair. And even what's probably more interesting is the fact that whenever you look at the men versus the women, the women had a gradient of skin complexion. So it went from fair to very fair to weedish to rosy. And whenever the men stated what they wanted, it was very simple. It was just like fair or very fair. And dark was never mentioned at all. So I think this is, it's interesting to see how it's, it affects women much more than it affects men. Because with men, it was cut and dry. Like they said exactly what they wanted. There was a gradient with the women. Um, I also looked at... or city with age I definitely found the correlation and I'm not quite sure if it was because this is the main marrying age that these people um, that these people who were if this is the main marrying age is this, if this is the reason why people emphasize or if it is a, a product of the younger generation to actually emphasize colorism and I think further work needs to be done to actually see what is the effect the true effect of colorism on the mainstream process and how does it affect um, women's psych psychology, like what does this do to their mental health? Because if you can put, if you can put on a cream but not actually go through a surgery because you don't have the money to actually change your physiognomy. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, because if you can, if you only have the money to buy a cream and you can't change your physiognomy with a, a procedure, what does this do for your, to your psyche? Because you can't, quote unquote, um, become the, the globalized version of and that's my food.